What if you could use retirement accounts to invest in crypto? With iTrust Capital, you can. iTrust Capital allows you to invest in your favorite crypto assets 24-7 with the tax benefits of an IRA. So instead of paying taxes on your crypto gains every year, you can defer taxes till you retire using an iTrust IRA. Or with an iTrust Roth IRA, you can withdraw tax-free at retirement because you're in this for the long haul. Start investing today at itrustcapital.com. And we're back, this time with another installment in the Thomas Sowell Trilogy with Conquest and Cultures. Here he does a full speech and Q&A at the end, answers a lot of great questions. This is an epic work from Thomas Sowell. If it's not in there already, I will have a link in the description for the full audiobook that you can listen to. The other books should be up already. Also, if you want to help support the channel, check out some of those referral links in the description. These are all services I use myself and believe in and find a lot of value in. Hopefully you will too. There's some great offers in there. Lastly, I'm going to have a quick little announcement at the end about Discord, so hang out for that as well. Okay, thanks a lot. Attaway. I like the cooperation here. Good afternoon. An AEI audience really needs no introduction to Tom Soul, but you're going to get one anyway. Beginning as a first-rate economist, Mr. Soul's curiosity about the way in which the world works and ways that are not adequately captured by economic models has made himself into a world-class sociologist and historian. Now, the sociologist requires some explanation, I suppose, because at the University of Chicago, which we both attended, sociology was regarded as one step above a high, high school civics course, but without the idiotic ideology. But any field of study that boasts Robert Nisbet and Peter Berger is worth the attention of the best minds. So forgive me, Tom, for calling you a sociologist. Mr. S Mr. Sowell has given us in rapid succession, and I emphasize rapid succession, the present book, Conquests and Cultures. And his preceding thoughts were in migrations and cultures and race and culture. And alongside that trilogy, there have been various other books and what appears to be a full-time career in journalism. Every year at the Hoover Institution's reception in Washington, there is an exhibit of books by the scholars of that institution. And every year there are one or two new books by Mr. Sowell. But he's never there. He's at home finishing his next book. No one should be so prolific. I can only think that he is substantially responsible for the profits of Evelyn Wood. Worse still, and this is really infuriating, those writings are not only prolific, they are profound reflections on facts about culture uncovered during prodigious reading and travels around the world. They are a rebuke to armchair theorists and a rebuttal of stereotypes and rigid ideologies. To read them is to profit enormously. As Tom Sowell puts it, the underlying theme of this trilogy has been that racial, ethnic, and national groups, as well as nations and civilizations, have their own respective cultures without which their economic and social histories cannot be understood. This, he said, collides head-on with accepted visions in which the fates of minorities are determined by society and also collides head-on with the prevailing doctrine of multiculturalism. Mr. Sowell says his trilogy aspires to that category, and I quote, of work, which may be visibly more than ephemeral, but, and still considerably less than definitive. The reader will find that aspiration too modest a statement of his achievement. Please welcome Mr. Sowell.
Thank you. I think I'm, I may start by shattering the notion that I actually write these things rapidly. Uh, I began writing this trilogy in April of 1982. <laughs> and so the book that just came out is uh, nine months after the previous book, but it, didn't, it was not written in nine months. Uh, originally, I began writing this as one book. Uh, but as a decade or so passed, and the manuscript began to grow and grow, uh, I realized that no one is going to publish a book the size of the Oxford English Dictionary, <laughs> unless, of course, it is the Oxford English Dictionary. So I was left there with the task of, what am I going to do with all this stuff? And will it ever see the light of day? And so in desperation, I asked, well, what is there that can be published right now? And it turned out that it was the last section, which would stand alone. And so the last section was published first. And then it seemed to me that the two sections that were easiest to turn into a book were the two middle sections with a little rewriting. And so that appeared next. Uh, and now finally I get to section one, <laughs> Conquests and Cultures. <laughs> if anyone is ever thinking of uh, reading this trilogy, the order would be the direct opposite of the order in which they were published. <laughs> It'll make the most sense. There's a question of why did I write it? I mean, after all, this is spending nearly one-third of my adult life on this one project. And it was intended to answer one of the most fundamental questions. Why are there such vast disparities in income and wealth among racial and ethnic groups, among nations, and among civilizations? Now, people in different parts of the philosophical spectrum have their own different explanations. But concern about that fact is spread all across the philosophical spectrum. It was not a, a radical writer, but Milton Friedman, who referred to gross inequities of income and wealth, which offend most of us, and declared, few can fail to be moved by the contrast between the luxury enjoyed by some and the grinding poverty suffered by others. If we want to move beyond lamenting poverty in a world in which it clearly does not have to exist, given the technological possibilities, then we have to seek explanations that stand up. And history offers opportunities to test explanations against a wider range of experience, and especially against experience of people with whom we have no particular ties, that is, they, were, they lived hundreds of years ago and thousands of year, miles away, and about whom we've not committed ourselves in terms of the arguments of the day that rage in our own country. Um, the history of conquest, well, there are, fun, are two fundamentally different explanations, whether you're talking about in, with domestic or international differences uh, in income and wealth. And one is that this is caused by external factors, uh, discrimination, exploitation, versus, for example, human capital. Uh, and of course, all of these things apply in some settings. In the history of conquest, you can see the contrast, I think, between the imperialism of Spain and the imperialism of the Roman Empire. Uh, Spain simply transferred vast amounts of wealth, largely in the form of gold and silver, from the Western Hemisphere to itself. Uh, as a result of these transfers, the amount of silver in Europe tripled, causing inflation across the con continent. The Spaniards also took out gold by the ton, except for that that was intercepted by British pirates on the high seas. But in the end, Spain, when the gold and silver ran out and the Indians died off working in the mines, Spain was left as one of the poorest countries in Western Europe. And so we cannot explain the present conditions of all the various groups and countries uh, just by the evils that they have done in the past, or even the cases where they have, in fact, transferred income and wealth. I think the strongest argument against the uh, exploitation theory internationally is what has happened after the imperialist powers have left. And here the, the book begins with the British. And although we think of the British as uh, you know, imperialists uh, on whose empire the sun never set, the fact is that for one-fifth of their recorded history, they were a conquered country and a province of the Roman Empire. The question is, what were the cultural consequences of this? Well, first of all, before the Romans came, there was no one in Britain 
who had ever said or done anything that would cause his name to be remembered in the pages of history. There were no buildings in Britain before the Romans came and built them. There was no London until the Romans built London. But the cultural consequences can be seen not only by what happened while they were there, but by what happened after they left. Because as the empire in later centuries came under attack on the continent, the Romans voluntarily pulled back. They pulled out of Britain, leaving everything intact to go try to defend uh, the, the empire. And in Britain, the standard of living began to decline. And there are many evidences of this. Um, bricks, glass, central heating, all disappeared for centuries in the British Isles. The political unit that had been created by the Romans, the Roman Britain, disintegrated into smaller units. The kinds of goods that had once been mass produced under the Romans now began to be crudely handmade. Even the dead reflected the change. People were buried in shallower graves and more often without coffins. This also happened on the continent where whole cities sometimes disappeared and others simply declined. You see something similar happening in our own times. The 20 years after the European imperialists pulled out of Africa, there were countries where the standard of living was lower than it was when the imperialists were there. More recently, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, when the Russians now pull out of Central Asia for the first time in 200 years, um, the standard of, li of living goes down, not up, as it would if exploitation were really much of an explanation. At one time, it was fashionable to glorify conquest. But in fact, uh, we've become much more aware of the oppressions and the atrocities that go along with it. Uh, conquest in cultures begins with a quote from John Stuart Mill that con conquerors almost universally treat the conquered people, in his words, as mere dirt under their feet, unquote. And this raises the question of what is the net balance of good and bad in conquest. And, and this book explicitly repudiates any attempt to make any such balance. All we can say today is, to try, is that we can try to understand what happened and what were the causes and what were the consequences. Now that doesn't make the history of conquest sort of an antiseptic uh, academic exercise because it has serious implications for some of the major issues of, of our times. Again, the central theme of these great disparities in wealth, uh, I think, are illuminated by some of the histories of conquest, as well as the history of migrations in the previous uh, volume. Many people seem to think that these disparities are something remarkable. Uh, in discussing the Indonesian crisis, many people have said the Chinese are only 5% of the population of Indonesia, and they own 80% of the capital of the country, uh, as if that's astonishing or presumably sinister. Uh, in point of fact, such situations have not been rare at all. In 19th century Russia, Germans were 1% of the population of the country. They were 40% of the Russian military high command. They were more than half of the officials in the Russian foreign ministry. Uh, in Britain, for a period of about 100 years, when the scholars have gone back through the diplomatic correspondence, they have found that the diplomatic correspondence of the Russians was written in German. <laughs> the Germans were also the vast majority of all the members of the St. Petersburg Academy of Sciences. Moreover, these were Baltic Germans who were themselves a minority within the 1% minority of Germans in Russia. They were not nearly as numerous as the Black Sea Germans or the Volga Germans. In, uh, in 20th century Brazil, in the early period, in Rio Grande do Sul, 100% of whole industries were German owned. These included the manufacture of trunks, stoves, hats, paper, soap, glasses, matches, beer of course, leather and neckties. Uh, Jews have never been as much as 1% of the population of Australia. Yet at one time, they owned most of the clothing stores in Melbourne. In Poland, between the two world wars, 
Jews were just 11% of the population, but they were more than half of all the physicians, two-thirds, and conducted more than two-thirds of the com commerce of the country. They were also three-fifths of all the physicians in Hungary, where they were just 6% of the population. Uh, people from India so predominated in the commerce of East, East Africa in colonial times that the rupee became the standard currency in much of East Africa. At the peak of their population size in Uganda, before the mass expulsions by Idi Amin, Indians, Pakistanis, and Goans put together added up to barely 1% of the population. Yet they owned at one time 80% of the capital of the country, including 90% of its cotton gins. It would be possible to go around the world and back through history citing similar groups and gross disparities involving the Japanese immigrants in southern Brazil, the Parsis in India, the Lebanese in West Africa, the Italians in Argentina, the Greeks in the Ottoman Empire, or the Igbos in northern Nigeria, among others. Here in the United States, you need only turn on a television set to see gross racial disproportionality in professional basketball. And if you pay attention to the uh, beer companies that sponsor this and other uh, sports event, you will discover that they are, were, these beer companies were created almost exclusively by Americans of German ancestry. So despite what is assumed in the media, in the politics, and in courts of law, gross statistical disparities are the rule, not the exception, in countries around the world. And they have been for centuries. That still leaves the question as to why there are such huge disparities. It's amazing how many of the people who find these disparities both offensive and uh, puzzling never look at the disparities in inputs behind the disparities in outputs. For example, um, back when admissions to the universities in Sri Lanka was by examination rather than by racial quotas as they later became, Members of the Tamil minority scored more than half of all the A's on the mathematical examinations, uh, over, rather than the Sinhalese majority. During the heyday of British uh, industrialization, 40% of all the patents in the world were held by people from Britain. In the late 19th century, just three countries produced over half the manufactured goods in the world. Britain, Germany, and the United States. And that was to remain that way for several decades. It's recently been estimated that 17% of the people in the world produce 80% of its output. Uh, nor are these always differences between biologically different people. It was estimated a few years ago that the 36 million overseas Chinese produced as much wealth as the 1 billion people in China itself. That's probably changed now that, now that China has Hong Kong. <laughs> when people talk about uh, very internal versus external causes of these kinds of disparities, they often talk in needlessly narrow terms. When they talk about nature versus nurture or heredity versus environment, nature is almost invariably taken to mean genes. Uh, in all three of the books in this series, uh, nature also includes geography. And geography has an enormous impact, not just in the obvious ways of having gold deposits in some countries and not in others, oil deposits in some other places, fertile soil some places and not other places, and so on. Uh, I argue uh, throughout the, the, the three books that the most profound effect of geography is on people and in particular on their contacts, how wide their contacts are with the range of other people in the world. Let me give a concrete example. Um, when the British confronted the Iroquois in North America, the Briti uh, their cultural universes were of radically different size. The British got to North America in the first place only because they had rudders on their ships that had been invented in China they were able to navigate with trigonometry invented in Egypt. They were able to use all kinds of knowledge written down in letters created by the Romans. They did their calculations in numbers created in India 
and brought to the West by Arabs. Meanwhile, the Iroquois could not draw upon the Aztecs or the Incas because they were unaware of their existence. And one of the reasons they were unaware of their existence was that the range of their cultural contacts was much, much narrower than that of the British. Uh, there are many reasons for this. Uh, in the Western Hemisphere, before the Europeans came, there were no horses. There were no oxen. There were no beasts of burden capable of carrying large loads for long distances or of pulling plows. The Eskimos used dogs. Uh, the Plains Indians used dogs. There were llamas in the Andes. But these don't compare to what can be done with horses or oxen or camels. There are all sorts of other animals that did not e exist. And so the range that, that, that you could uh, reach was very constricted by that. More generally, though, navigable waterways have played a major role in deciding how large your cultural universe is going to be. What first got me into this was when I discovered that before the building of the Transcontinental Railroad, you could reach San Francisco faster and cheaper from a port in China than from St. Louis. Because that's the difference between the cost of land and water transport. People in the city of Belize in the Caucasus were buying kerosene from Houston, Texas, 8,000 miles away across water, rather than from the Baku oil fields less than 400 miles away across land. And the access to the water is obviously radically different in different places. Another uh, fact that uh, startled me and seemed almost impossible at first uh, was that uh, the continent of Africa, although more than twice the size of Europe, has a shorter coastline. And it has a shorter coastline because the continent of Europe goes like this around the coastline. And so there are harbors everywhere. And the continent of Africa has a smooth coastline with very few harbors anywhere. You throw in navigable waterways, and you find other huge disparities between all the regions of the, of the, of the world. Uh, sometimes you have the waterways, but they're not navigable because they're plunging down. For example, the Amazon riverbed drops 20 miles in the last uh, 1,000 miles to the sea. The uh, riverbed of the Zaire River drops 1,000 feet and 250 miles. And that's why you cannot sail ships up the Zaire River. Uh, the Yangtze, you can, you can sail a 10,000 ton ocean going vessel hundreds of miles up the Yangtze, and smaller vessels hundreds of miles beyond that. There's not a single river in the continent of Africa where you can do that. Even the Nile could not support the largest ships in Roman times. If you look at the um, proportion of the continent that's open to water, um, one third of the entire continent of Europe consists of islands and peninsulas. One percent of South America consists of islands and peninsulas. If you th and what this means is that people simply do not have a w as wide a range of places they can reach, places they're familiar with. One other number that, that struck me, uh, Africans are 10% of the population of the world. They have one third of all the languages in the world. One of the signs of the cultural fragmentation when you don't have all the things that tie things together. Now, one of the problems with this approach is that, that it, uh, some people regard it as geographic determinism. And what, ge what, ge what geography does is, is determine the limits. And what, what individuals do is determine what they're going to do within those limits. So that, for example, when the Spaniards conquered Argentina, Argentina had some of the, and still does, some of the finest agricultural land in the world. But the Spaniards did not come there to become farmers. And so it didn't matter. Uh, and a half a century before Columbus, the Chinese had voyages of exploration that were longer than Columbus's voyage, uh, and ships that were more advanced than Columbus's ships. But they did not choose to continue. In fact, they made a deliberate decision to pull in and to isolate themselves from the world, a decision they paid for for centuries to come. There's a, Shelby Steele has a wonderful observation that uh, whites are desperately afraid of being considered racist, and blacks are desperately afraid of being considered inferior. And cultural relativism rescues both but at a very high cost. 
in terms of divorce from reality. And much of what is called cultural relativism or multiculturalism consists of trying to artificially preserve cultures and having each group paint itself into its own little corner, living on its own capital alone. And what this is doing is artificially recreating the kinds of handicaps that have proved to be devastating to isolated people all around the world, whether they're isolated in mountain villages or on little islands in the ocean or wherever. What is there about particular cultures that makes some of them more conducive to economic progress than others? That's a very large question whose answer will come from somebody else who will write another trilogy in some later years. At the moment, it's an uphill fight just to get people to concede that there are indeed major internal differences which do not depend upon the outside society. The outside society does, in fact, have its influence. But we can't start from the a priori notion that that is necessarily the dominant influence. Yet any attempt to say that the, there are any in, internal factors says that you're blaming the victim. But of course, you don't blame somebody for something that happened before he was born. The question is, what, what, are, what about conquest specifically and its role? Uh, that, that, that's a very large book in itself. But I'll, just qu I'll finish by just quoting the first paragraph uh, of Conquests and Cultures. It begins with a quotation. We do not live in the past but the past in us, unquote. Conquest is a major shaper of that past and a major part of the cultures of the world today. Wars of conquest have changed the language, the economy, and the moral universes of whole people. As a result of conquest, the Western Hemisphere today is a larger region of European civilization than Europe itself. Even those in the Western Hemisphere who hate European civilization, express that hatred in a European language and denounce it as immoral by European standards of morality. The history of conquest is not just about the past, it's very much about the present and about how we came to be where we are economically, intellectually, and morally. Thank you. Now, occasionally, there have been questions. <laughs> uh, I, yes? I wonder if you could discuss, uh, in part of your discussion of migration, the uh, effect of uh, <clears throat> refugees, refugee status, which is something that results with wars. And, yes. I guess most people, at one time or another, were refugees from some place. Yeah. Them. Well, uh, that would be part of the general question of migration. Unfortunately, I think there, there's, I'm reluctant to discuss it in those general terms because I think migration is already discussed in two general terms. Uh, people ask, are you for or against immigration? Well, a lot depends on who's immigrating. <laughs> now, today, one cannot say that. You're either, you either, either have to be for or against immigration of everybody anywhere, virtually without restriction, or uh, uh, you're for throwing the, uh, you know, going the other extreme. Um, there was a time when immigration was enormously important, particularly in the history of the United States. Well, of course, the whole history would have been different otherwise. Uh, but the question is whether we can transfer to very different conditions today what existed 100 or 200 or 300 years ago, uh, especially now that we have so many other ways of transferring human capital from the internet to multinational corporations, uh, 
to all sorts of other uh, devices. Uh, more, than, more than half the PhDs in the United States in engineering do not go to Americans. Uh, so here is a, a great transfer of human capital occurring uh, without, in most cases, uh, immigration, or at least openly admitted immigration. Yes. Tom, uh, can you say a little bit about the Mayans? I was terribly impressed in my first visit to the Mayan ruins, and uh, I really struck. Did you, did you get it into a comparison between with, where they were with Europe and even in building and things like that? I, I well, see this is part of the book, and I'm, I'm curious about. Yeah. That. Um, the May Mayans, I believe, one one of the few groups in the, in the Western Hemisphere to have uh, had the wheel. Uh, and, and the wheel is often considered one of the landmarks on the road to civilization. Um, but the wheels they had were only on toys for children. <laughs> uh, and I, I, was, I, was, I was puzzled by two things, why there was no wheel in the Western Hemisphere. When I discovered there were no horses and oxen, it became, you know, the, the, the value of the wheel declines very sharply if you don't have someone to pull the wagons. Uh, s similarly with plows, that uh, if you don't have someone to pull those plows through the heavy soils, you, you don't have that. Uh, I go into a little bit of, of, about the Mayans. Um, unfortunately, you end up doing sort of mini monographs on, on some of these groups. The, the chapter in which I cover them is called Western Hemisphere Indians. And so I, I have the, uh, the Mayans, the Incas, the Aztecs, the Plains Indians, the Iroquois, and others. Uh, but uh, I, I, will, I will defer to you as the authority on the Mayans. <laughs> all, all questions I get will be forwarded. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, we're very fortunate to have two major works of interpretation of history from economists your work and that of David Landis on the wealth and poverty of nations. I wonder if you could comment on whether or not you have any major differences of interpretation with, uh, with Landis. Not that I can think of offhand, but I'm sure if I went back through it, I would find something that would set me off. Uh, no, I, I have a great respect for his work. In fact, I, I posed the question to him that apparently no one has answered. Is I'm puzzled as to why there was iron and steel in Europe, Asia, and Africa centuries before Columbus got to the United States, and yet there was no iron and steel anywhere in the Western Hemisphere. And uh, I, so I figured I would ask David Landis, who's the person most, most likely to know the answer to that. And his, his, his answer didn't tell me an awful lot about iron and steel, but it did get, give me some thoughts. He said, should we assume that everything would be discovered by everybody? Or, or is it possible that there are some things which will be discovered by one or two people in a few places and will then spread outward? To, to the rest of the people. And if that's the case, then of course uh, Europe and Asia are in much more communication with each other than they are with the Western Hemisphere. And even Africa, although there are many barriers, nevertheless has some communication with the Middle East. Uh, and so things could spread among those three continents uh, much more than they could to the Western Hemisphere. Of course. Um, and if someone in the Western Hemisphere didn't come up with that idea, then it just would not exist. Yes. Uh, next issue of Cato Policy Report, Reuben Brenner argues that one of the contributors to economic growth for the most successful economies over many centuries has been openness to immigrants, to talent from other places. Mm. And he suggests that we are now experiencing, to a great extent, a globalization of the free market. We're seeing more opportunities for people in their homelands in a number of places around the world and that that may result in a relative decline in U.S. economic growth because we will no longer be able to count on an influx of the most talented people from around the world. I wonder if you agree with that general uh, description oh, well, of history and whether you see that as, as a relative well, well, in, 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 a, in a sense, I mean, uh, I'm less interested in the, in the migration of bodies than of ideas of knowledge and uh, very, very often you have very profound changes brought about where people are merely sojourners. For example, in much, much of the early industrialization of the United States came from people who were British, who came over, taught Americans how to do various kinds of things, made their money and went back home. Uh, today, uh, you have the Japanese, of course, setting up Toyota and other Honda, whatever, in the United States but not necessarily themselves migrating to become citizens of the United States. And so their know-how and their organizational methods and so forth can be transferred without the people themselves relocating. 
Um, the industrialization of Japan would be a classic example. They drew very heavily on people from Britain, from the United States, to some extent from Germany and other countries who came to Japan, or they sent the Japanese uh, students to these other places to learn, and they came back and brought the skills with them. But there was no significant immigration into Japan, and there still is not to this very moment. Uh, I'm told that even Japanese Americans who settle in Japan are treated like foreigners. <laughs> yes. Yes. Dr. Solon, I'll ask you a question I asked you last time I saw you here. Uh, when are you going to write another good book on education? I'm on the School of Work Committee for Fairfax County. I'd well, love to uh, see you jump in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, whenever there's a suicide mission, someone always thinks of me. <laughs> Fortunately, there's, there has been a, a very good book on education written, and I was struck by the mere fact that it had a straightforward title, as distinguished from the kind of talk that you normally get. And the title is simply Bad Teachers. <laughs> so, in fact, uh, recently I urged that anyone who is going to read just one book on education in his lifetime should read that book, even in preference to anything that I've uh, written, because uh, I'll, I'll just pass up the extra sales, because I, I, th I thought it was more important that they uh, understand this aspect of teaching. Yes. I was wondering if you addressed at all the migration of uh, social capital, institutions, uh, private property, contracts, limited government. Not a lot except by saying how difficult it is. Uh, you know, that, uh, and you see this in the, in the former British Empire, where, where the people started out, you know, with all the parliamentary forms and the judges wearing the wigs and, and all that kind of business. Uh, and yet, very quickly degenerated in many cases into brutal dis dictatorships. Uh, you can transfer the institutions. You cannot transfer the centuries of history that make the institutions work. A few years ago, some Nigerian students visiting Stanford uh, uh, met with me. And one of the questions they asked was, why did I think there were so many military coups in Nigeria? And I said, no, the question is not why there are so many military coups in Nigeria. There are military coups all over the world. The question is, why are there a certain set of countries where military coups are considered unthinkable? Because those, are the, those countries are the minority. And even in their history at one time or another, there were military crew, coups. If you want to include Cromwell, for example. Uh, and the reason is a certain set of ideas have taken hold. So that if the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff said, listen, all it would take is a battalion of soldiers to go over to the White House, overwhelm the guards, and, I, and I'll just move in, you know, and, and, and there we are. Uh, it, but if he gave that order, his soldiers would arrest him. <laughs> and there are countries where they would not. But it also says something, something about the nature of power, how subjective it ultimately is. That when Yeltsin went through his crisis a few years ago, and the Russian troops were given one set of orders by his opponents and another set of orders by him, the troops had the guns. They could have done what they wanted to do. But they chose to follow his orders. And that's why they have the kind of government they have, rather than a profoundly different kind of government. Uh, I think there's a tendency, and perhaps Marx is to be blamed for some of this, to think of, quote, the objective conditions of society and so forth. Uh, and I think those objective conditions are greatly overrated. Those objective conditions are the products of subjective things. And those kinds of things don't migrate uh, uh, very, very well. Yes? Uh, I was wondering if you're familiar with the work of the Red Diamond. Uh, who yes. Who wrote a book called Guns, Germs, and Steel. And yes. Your thoughts on his argument for explaining how different societies evolve? Well, I can't, I can't recall the whole book in one but I, I was impressed particularly by his, um, he also puts an emphasis on geography. In fact, someone wrote uh, to uh, Forbes, and I'm told it was an orchestrated campaign, uh, that I had stolen some of my ideas from Jared Diamond, and I pointed out that uh, uh, you don't steal from someone who writes three years after you've written the same thing. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think he puts an emphasis on geography that is very important. I think the emphasis on germs is also very important. One of the, one of the reasons, perhaps the main reason, why the Europeans conquered the Western Hemisphere before they conquered Africa, even, they, even though they knew about Africa a thousand years before they knew about the Western Hemisphere, was that the disease environments were radically different. So that when they uh, invaded the Western Hemisphere, it was not uncommon for European diseases to wipe out half of an Indian tribe. And it was not unheard of it 
for it to wipe out 90% of an Indian tribe. And not necessarily where there were direct contacts. Uh, when Pizarro marched upon the Incan capital, there were already people dying in large numbers in that capital of European diseases who had never seen a white man because those diseases had spread through the Indian population had it reached them before Pizarro reached them. In Africa, it was directly the opposite. Uh, there, it was the Europeans who were enormously susceptible to tropical diseases. Uh, one scholar says the average uh, life expectancy of a white man in Africa was less than one year. At one point, the Pope uh, uh, issued a ruling that civil governments could not execute a priest, no matter what he had done. And the Portuguese would then assign such priests to an island off Africa, <laughs> knowing that they'd be gone in, in no time. <laughs> So the, the key factor of European imperialism in the tropics is quinine rather than guns. Uh, there, there was not, and, and again, these, things, these disparities are not um, reciprocal. That is, the Europeans had very little susceptibility to uh, the diseases of the Western Hemisphere, with the lone exception of syphilis, which began to spread throughout Europe with the return of Columbus's sailors. It uh, buttresses some stereotypes about sailors. <laughs> which, alas, are sometimes spill over to Marines. <laughs> yes. Yes. I wondered in all this study of cultures if you uh, came across any particular signs of cultures in decline. Warning yeah. signs. Oh, yes. Well, of course, the great cat catastrophe was Rome because it was not just Britain that went to pieces when the Roman Empire collapsed. It was all of Western Europe. Uh, one economic historian says, no city in 19th century Europe had as secure a water supply as they had in Roman times. That uh, the collapse was everywhere. But you also see the effect of not being uh, conquered by the Romans in Eastern Europe. That those people who were conquered by the Romans had the Roman letters. Uh, in Eastern Europe for a very long time, the Slavic languages had no written counterparts until these written counterparts were then created by people from Western Europe or from uh, Greece. Uh, uh, for, for them. Yes? I, I think you might have, partly answered, might have partly answered my question already there. It goes hugely back into history. Uh, most people are familiar with the Germanic ascendancy that uh, Europe had during the 19th, right, even very early 20th century. Oh, in the Middle Ages? Yeah, well. But, um, what seems to be a bit forgotten, though, the Irish are voting tomorrow in, an, <coughs> in a double referendum, is that uh, before Rome, the Celts, as <laughs> scholars tell me I should pronounce the word, yeah. instead of Celts, the Celts had, were the ascendant people, numerically at least, yes. uh, all, all over Europe. Yes. And now there's just the Celtic fringe. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, where you know, a few provincial people still speak it, although I think it's pretty... Are gone. It was well. In this century, by the way, in um, in Brittany, they still spoke the Celtic language. I am told. I am told because yeah. they, they now have Welsh broadcasts. The multiculturalism is afflicting the entire Anglo-Saxon world. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm told that people in Brittany can understand much of what is being said in, in the Welsh language. Oh, that was being told me a long time ago. And it seemed uh, declined. In, but my question is kind of huge. Uh, is there any large reason why the Celts went into such decline at the time of the Romans? Because they had dominated Europe. Wow, that's a tough one. Uh, in one sense, and it's an easy one in another, uh, ascendancies always pass. Uh, and uh, there, are, there are those who argue the various reasons for it. Uh, complacency is al always a major reason, I think. That uh, I think of the Ottoman Empire in particular, that they were so far in advance of Europe at one time that they paid no attention to the Europeans. And even their scholars would study China or India, but they would not waste their time studying Europe. And unfortunately for the Ottomans, the part of Europe that they were most in contact with was, was the most backward part of Europe. And they had no idea what was happening in Western Europe. And by the time they found out, it was too late. Because they, they had defeated European armies on the battlefield again and again over the centuries. And suddenly they began losing. And they started losing it first on the sea and then on the land. And, you know, it all, it all came apart. But this has happened over and over again. Yes. Sir, did you try to 
give a cultural explanation in your book about why Spain was this unique example in history uh, of an imperial power that ruined itself by becoming too rich, simply transforming gold and silver, as, as you mentioned. And what, what would that explanation be in your view? Well, there are lots of um, possibilities. A number of people who've specialized in studying the, that culture uh, have argued that this is a culture from which one uh, disdains commerce, disdains manual labor. Uh, Lewis Harrison has written a couple of books along this line, and there are others. Uh, so that if you look at the history of Spanish uh, offshoot societies in the Western Hemisphere, you find them not being very good in those particular areas until immigrants from those parts of Europe which are good in, in, in those areas. And this is why you have the Germans coming into southern Brazil and producing uh, a total monopoly, as it were, of whole industries. Uh, you have the Japanese coming in and in uh, various agricultural areas also having a huge uh, predominance because their whole p pattern is, is very different. And it's more than theorists saying this. The, uh, the, the governments of these countries, that is the Spanish, Spanish uh, uh, governments of these countries themselves tried to import non-Spaniards uh, to do things which they thought they would not be able to do. For example, opening up frontiers uh, in Paraguay. Um, uh, for example, uh, when the Japanese came in, the Paraguayans were absolutely baffled uh, as, to the, as to the work uh, ethic of these people. Uh, the, 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 the Japanese were equally baffled by, by the Paraguayans, uh, <laughs> particularly with their concept of time. That uh, In Tokyo, they had the, you know, the trains running on, on, on the minute, you know, like the Swiss or something. Uh, and of course, as the first Japanese immigrants came in, they found the schedule bore no relationship to when they would actually get there, that the train would stop and the engineer would get off and talk to all his friends in the village and catch up on what had been happening and how the passengers sat on the air and, uh, and fretted. So there are these huge kinds of differences. Someone mentioned the, 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 uh, uh, what, I'll be, what I'll call the Celtic fringe, simply because I don't consider myself a scholar in that area. Um, if you look at migrations, most of those migrations are from very specific places in one country to very specific places in other countries. That is, people do not simply come from Britain to the United States or from Italy to Australia. They came from one little area of Britain and settled in one little area of the United States. And so the people who settled in New England were very different, radically different from those who settled, let's say, in Virginia and other parts of the South. They spoke differently. Their whole uh, ethos was different. Uh, and that was all transferred. One of the other curious things I, I discovered is that many cultural features die out where they originated, but survive where they're transplanted. And uh, in the United States, one of the curious examples is a style of speech. Uh, of course, before you had the transportation revolution, you had much more regional dialect. Uh, but, and, and you also had, uh, as time went on, a deliberate effort to standardize the English language so that when people began to move from Liverpool to London, they'd be able to know what people were talking about in London. Um, and so in England, many of these ways of talking died out while they continued on in the South. And then as education spread in the South, first to whites and then to blacks, it began to die out among whites and lastly among blacks. And so today you have a whole way of talking, which is ironically called black English which is a direct descendant of what was said in various parts of England from which white Southerners came, and which are usually nowhere to be found anywhere in Africa. Thank you very much. OK, I'm sure you enjoyed that. Please type the word goat in the comments, greatest of all time for Thomas Sowell. I do believe he gets a kick out of that at 91 years old. Um, also, quick announcement about Discord for Christmas. I am opening it up. So we do have a few people in there already and a few moderators, and so far it's going well. Um, just want to make it a space where we can interact, share ideas, post articles, that type of thing. Keep it fun. Keep it light. If it becomes a problem, if people start getting disrespectful or it just becomes a pain, I will shut the whole thing down. So <laughs> no promises how long it'll be up, but let's give it a go and see how it see how it works out. I keep getting requests for it, so we'll give it a full-fledged try and see what we do. 
Okay, thank you so much, and until next time.